Greetings in the name of the Lord, and again, thank you for tuning in to this week's message. I just praise God that we're able to use technology uh, to reach out to uh, those that are uh, wanting to uh, shelter in place still for various reasons, and we want to just make sure that uh, everyone's receiving these and being blessed by them, and we'll continue to do this uh, even though we've opened up. My heart's been to continue to make these messages uh, known to church members and family and friends. And so please uh, feel free to, to put these out uh, and spread them around as uh, we continue to use technology to reach uh, people for Jesus Christ. And again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we're going to look at uh, another part of Abram's life as we shared last week. I've titled this a transformed worldview and let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, again, thank you so much for your word. Your word is truth. Your word is the standard that we can stand on. Your word is uh, the rock because it is Jesus and Jesus is the word. And I thank you that we have a, a refuge that we can go to in the day of trouble, which we are experiencing. And I thank you, Father, that your word is alive. It's not just a written document. It is a real living, breathing testimony and power uh, from on high that changes the hearts and lives of people. So do your spiritual surgery as you see fit as we continue to open your word and study it together, applying its truths to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we looked at the call of Abram, how God broke into the physical world with all of its sin and wickedness, and he, he called one man out of everything he ever knew and told him to go to a place he had never been. And so Abram had to trust and exercise faith in God and how it was in a God that had only just revealed himself. In following God's command to leave, Abram would never be the same again. His whole view of life and death would forever change as he became a worshiper of the one true God. In Abraham's life, we see the answers to three of the most complicated questions that will ever be asked. And it is, who am I, what am I, and why am I? Again, who am I? What am I and why, I, why am I? How these questions are answered and lived out in a person's life, they consist of what makes up the beliefs that affect a person's attitude and their way of thinking, which determines their behavior and outlook on life. You put it all together in one word and you come up with the word worldview. A worldview is an explanation and interpretation of the world and the application of this view to a person's life. So number one, all people, all people possess a particular worldview. Francis Schaeffer says this, there is a flow of history and culture. This flow is rooted and has its wellspring in the thoughts of people. People are unique in the inner life of the mind. What they are in their thought world determines how they act. This is true of their value systems, and it is true of their creativity. It is true of their corporate actions, such as political decisions, and it is true of their personal lives. The results of their thought world flow through their fingers or their tongues into the external world. And this is true of Michelangelo's chisel, and it is true of a dictator's sword. What a powerful quote from Francis Schaeffer. You see, a person's worldview is their blueprint for reality, describing their understanding of the world and then prescribing how they will live in that world. And whether a person will admit it or not, everyone has a particular worldview. Everyone. Sometimes it's based on what a person feels in a set coincidences that occur. For others, there's a direct link to a, a relationship with a personal God who loves them and cares for them and guides their life. Then there are those who feel that 
there are cosmic forces in the spiritual world that have an impact on their life. For others, it's a historical belief or a superstitious belief and worldview or a, the way of their cultural upbringing and how they've learned a behavior. That is all tied into the making and shaping of a worldview. Number two, apart from God, apart from experiencing the power of God, apart from experiencing regeneration or rebirth, all worldviews are distorted. They're distorted. Listen to this. Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. God had made himself known to Adam and Eve. He created Adam and breathed life into him and made himself known. The first thing that Adam saw was God. Think of that. The first thing that Adam saw was God. Birthed into a relationship, and God was Adam's worldview. And Eve, when she was created, God was her worldview. And even their children. But over time, man began to live according to the dictates of his fallen nature. When Adam sinned, their worldview changed. When Eve sinned, their worldview changed. And guess what? They passed that on to their children. And even though Abel had a, a, a proper worldview on how to worship the Lord, and his life revolved around his relationship with God. I know that because of how he worshiped and what he brought as a sacrifice. Remember, they experienced the fall because of their parents, born into that sinful nature. Cain had a different worldview, a different way to worship God. And it showed in the end, it seemed right to him, but in the end, it produced death. The knowledge of God over time was mixed with man's distorted view of life in their distorted worship of things and places and, and people. And this all was passed on from generation to generation. The result was that the people became very wicked. God again broke in, made himself known to Noah. Judgment came upon the earth and then deliverance through the ark. And then the cycle started all over again. When unregenerate human nature supersedes God's revelation, chaos ensues. And that's exactly what happened. You have the Tower of Babel, and then boom. It happened all over again. A distorted worldview. And it was passed on from generation to generation until God broke through again and called Abram. Letter A, an individual's worldview becomes their way of thinking based on what they value. Also based on what they value. It's been said that when a person defines their values, then they will begin to live life based on the commitment to those values. For example, the Age of Enlightenment was a term used to describe the trends in thought and letters in Europe in the American colonies during the 18th century prior to the French Revolution. Of the basic assumptions and beliefs common to philosophers and intellectuals, perhaps the most important is an abiding faith in the power of human reason. The age was enormously impressed by Isaac Newton's discovery of universal gravitation. If humanity could so unlock the laws of the universe, God's own laws, why could it not also discover the laws underlying all of nature and society? People came to assume that through a judicious use of reason, an unending progress would be possible. Progress in knowledge and technical achievement and even in moral values. A great premium was placed on the discovery of truth through the observation of nature rather than through the study of the authority of the Bible. Although they saw the church as the principal force that had enslaved the human mind in the past, most enlightenment thinkers did not renounce religion altogether. They opted rather for a form of deism, accepting the existence of God and of a hereafter, but rejecting the intricacies of Christian theology. 
Human aspirations, they believe, should not be centered on the next life, but rather on the means of improving this life. Worldly happiness was placed before religious salvation. Nothing was attacked more intensely and, for, and uh, fervently than the church with all its wealth, political power, and suppression of the free exercise of reason. Wow, sounds like exactly what's happening today. You see, cultural worldviews, they are constructed by people groups in an attempt to interpret life, such as the origin of the universe and of man. This does not mean that their worldview is correct, though. Abram was experiencing a cultural worldview that was wrong. It was based on self. It was based on pleasure. It was based on the worship of false gods. And everything came out of that worship of false gods. The one true God and creator of the universe, he broke into that culture and made himself known through revelation to Abram. And he brought Abram out of a cultural worldview that he was living in. In other words, God brought Abram out of darkness and would begin to open his understanding to spiritual light, which consists of a relationship with God who is light and is truth and is the life. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household and go to a land I will show you. Three major elements make up a worldview, philosophy, theology, and culture. The three major features of a person's existence are God, the concept of ultimate reality, or humanity, the reality of human existence, and nature, the existence and the purpose of the world around man, both physical and spiritual. The culture that a person lives within is the incorporated system of learned behavior patterns, which are characteristic of the members of a society. These characteristics that make up a cultural worldview are then passed on from generation to generation. These learned cultural behavior patterns consist of traditions and rituals, superstitions, convictions, and beliefs. Put together, they instill within people a sense of what their culture feels is right and wrong. Again, Francis Schaeffer says this, people have presuppositions that they will live more consistently on the basis of these presuppositions than even they themselves may realize. By presuppositions, we mean the basic way an individual looks at life, his basic worldview, the grid through which a person considers to be the truth of what exists. People's presuppositions lay a grid for all they bring forth into the external world. Their presuppositions also provide the basis of their values and therefore the basis of their decisions. Imagine this, when God isn't the concept of ultimate reality, then human nature is, human reason is, human philosophy is. Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Which brings us to letter B. Cultural worldviews are constructed by people groups in an attempt to interpret the meaning and application of life. Cultural worldviews are constructed by people groups in an attempt to interpret the meaning and application of life. Abram was experiencing a cultural worldview that was wrong. Again, it was based on self-pleasure and the worship of false gods. The one true God, the creator of the universe, was calling Abram out of a cultural worldview. God literally, literally was calling Abram out of spiritual darkness. Out of spiritual darkness. And he said, go to a land I will show you. That was a call to depart, to walk away. Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. It was a call to depart, to walk away from, to sever oneself from the worldview, the philosophy, and the false religion of the people. 
And with that call came the command to sever ties with his family and his father's household. This command to leave was a breaking away from. It was a physical and spiritual severing from a worldview in the culture of the day. And with that call came an amazing promise. The Lord said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Number three, a biblical worldview is based on an individual's response to God's revealed will. A biblical worldview, a godly worldview, it's based on an individual's response to God's revealed will. Will God revealed his will to Abram, and Abram responded to that will. And his whole worldview changed. Because man is sinful and the heart is deceitfully wicked, man needs something outside himself to give him a right perspective. God did that when he called Abram. A biblical worldview then acknowledges that God is the creator and sustainer of all things and that he has revealed his plan and purpose through his word. For us, it's the Bible. Little did Abram know that he was the living, breathing Bible, that we would read his life. Think of that. We would get to read his experience, which makes up God's revealed will, the Bible. And even though there was not a Bible in Abram's day, he had received the revelation of God's verbal word. Abram was now able to gain purpose and real meaning in his life. And he developed a relationship with God. And not only was God calling Abram out of his culture, the Lord was establishing something entirely new. Notice four times the Lord said, I will make you. I will make you. I will bless you. I will bless you, he says. I will uh, curse those that curse you. Four times the Lord said, I will. I will. And in all those I wills, God does the forming and the shaping of a worldview. This was a great invitation for Abram to be brought into God's purpose and plan and will. God was choosing Abram by grace to be the father of a nation, God's nation of chosen people. Not only is God calling Abram out of his culture, the Lord is establishing something entirely new, entirely new. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Paul said to the church at Philippi, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purposes. You see, without a new heart, we cannot have a, a changed mind. With the new heart that God gives us through salvation, through what we call being born anew or born again, a person receives a new heart, which in essence, they, they, they possess now the mind of Christ. Their whole worldview begins to change. And for Abram, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, God said. Why? Because through Abram would be the seed, the promised seed, which would be the Messiah. But also through Abram would be a brand new worldview, bringing people back to square one, back to the basics, back to the, a relationship with God. The Hebrew renders it all families of the land. This statement forms the climax and the series of promises. In thee means thy seed, which is taken to mean the Lord Jesus Christ. Book of Acts chapter 3 says, And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. 
Galatians 3, 6 and 9, consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understanding that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abram. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Again, Galatians 3, 15 through 17, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning the one person who is the Christ in your offspring, from your seed, and in the Messiah who will spring from you with all families of the earth being blessed. For as he will take on human nature, he will also taste death for every man. His gospel will be preached throughout the world and countless blessings will be the result on all mankind through his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension and intercession. The curse will be removed. First, I will make you into a great nation. This will compensate for the loss of his country. The nation to which he had belonged was enslaved to idolatry. To escape from it and its defining influence was itself a benefit. But to be made the head of a chosen nation was a double blessing. Second, the Lord said, I will bless you. The place of his birth and kindred was the scene of all his past earthly joys. But the Lord will make up the loss to him in a purer and safer scene of temporal prosperity. Thirdly, I will make your name great. This was to compensate him for his father's house. He was to be a patriarch of a new house on account of which he would be known and venerated all over the world. Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Here the Lord identifies the cause of Abram with his own and declares him to be essentially connected with all who come into contact with him and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Think of that promise. All people were under the curse of the fall because of Adam's sin, but now the people of the earth will have an invitation to participate in a blessing in thee. In Abraham is this blessing laid up as a treasure hidden field to be realized in due time. All the families of mankind shall ultimately enter into the enjoyment of this unbounded blessing. And the Lord saw fit to select a man to be the head of a race suited for the revelation of mercy by recalling the sin captivated world to the knowledge and love of himself. The Lord's purpose through Abram reveals the process of removing the curse of sin, supplying the blessing of pardon and eventually proclaiming to all the nations his plan of salvation by grace through him. The special call of Abram contemplates the calling of the Gentiles, that through a series of events by which the legal obstacles to the divine mercy are to be fulfilled through Jesus the Christ and the Holy Spirit of the Lord was and still poured out towards men in an attempt to bring them to repentance. This call was not something to be made light of. This call birthed a nation of people that God would reveal himself to over and over and over again. So Abram, it says, departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. How a person responds to God is crucial to what makes up a positive or negative worldview. A person's belief or denial of God will have various consequences in the life of that individual and also those around him or her. Thoughts and actions follow the convictions or denial of God. You see, people respond upward, which is their relationship with or without God. People respond inward, which is their relationship to their inner being. And people respond outward, which is their relational response towards other human beings. What a person believes about God will reveal the whole of who they really are. Their upward, inward, and outward relationships. And the consequences 
that follow the upward, inward, and outward relationships can be a blessing or they can be a curse, all based on a person's worldview. Is it biblical or is it not? Purpose and meaning in life is the quest that almost every person is searching for, especially in how they deal with humanity. The convictions that a person has concerning their purpose and meaning in life will affect every other area of their life. This will affect the value that one places on marriage, on the family, on a job, on a church, and the relationships that they have with others. The author of Hebrews says, By faith, Abram, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. At this stage... It is likely that Abraham did not know the exact purpose for which he was separated or could clearly distinguish the spiritual from the temporal branches of the promise. But in the consciousness of supernatural guidance and with the hope through unknown blessings, he departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and his whole worldview would be changed because of it. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What made Abraham different from the other men in his day was his, God was changing his inner life. Abram was beginning to develop beliefs that would become occupied with what is unseen and spiritual. These words are so powerful and Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Abram went forth. Letter A, more consequences for thought and action follow the affirmation or denial of God than from answering any other basic question in life. I'm gonna say that again. More consequences for thought and action follow the affirmation or denial of God than from answering any other basic question. The word departed, halak, means to go, to walk, to behave, to proceed, to move, to go away, to live. It means a manner of life. Abraham took his convictions that God was revealing himself and God was the one true God, and he put them into action. He left. He departed. He departed and left so much behind his father's household, his people, his country, and his worldview. You may possess a biblical worldview and it will do nothing for you or those around you. But if, you, if your biblical worldview possesses you and you are convinced of its truth, then like Abram, you will be compelled to action. I want to say that again. You may possess a biblical worldview and it will do nothing for you or those around you. It's just in your head. But if your biblical worldview possesses you and you are convinced of its truth and you value it, then like Abraham, you will be compelled into action. Number four, a biblical worldview has a direct connection also with worship. A biblical worldview has a direct connection with worship. The Lord appeared, it says, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give you this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. In other words, he put his faith in the name of the Lord. And how do we know that's true? Because he built an altar and he worshiped. Letter A, the building of an altar was an act of worship entirely in honor of God. The first thing that Abraham does on his arrival is to acknowledge God. There was no self-glorying in this act of worship, self-enthronement, 
has produced a society that cherishes the individual self above everything else. Chuck Colson states this truth by calling it a new dark age. There was none of that with Abram. This was about honoring God. Letter B, the building of the altar was an act of worship that expressed his acknowledgement of divine guidance. Abram recognized God as the one who has protected him, who has brought him out of darkness. And building the altar was also an acknowledgement of, of God in, in the time of this new life that he was entering into. The altar signified a grateful heart. C, the building of the altar was an act of worship that was valuable in God's sight because it expressed Abram's readiness to consecrate himself to God. In other words, he's saying in this act of worship, I, I have chosen you, God. You have chosen me and I have chosen to come after you, to follow you. I've chosen to respond to you. And because of that, I'm setting myself apart to you. See, the, old, the altar was a token of Abraham's faith. The altar suggests to that local worship is important. The altar suggests that local worship is important. Though God is everywhere, Abraham felt the need to localize God. There are places that have been separated as special and holy a person's prayer closet, the family altar, and the church. In the building of an altar, letter D was an act of worship that expressed faith in the fulfillment of the divine promises. J. Parker says, Abram set up his altar along the line of his march. Blessed are they whose way is known by marks of worship. The altar is the highest seal of ownership. God will not likely forsake his temple. This setting up of the altar shows that our spiritual life ought to be attested by outward sign and profession. Abram had the promise in his heart, yet he did not live a merely contemplative life. He was not lost in religious musings. He built his altar and set up his testimony in the midst of people and made them sharers of a common worship. You see, Abram did not limit his worship to himself, but he made it plain for everyone that was with him to witness. He built altars to the Lord and called on the name of, his, of the Lord. And his wife, his nephew, all his servants, they saw his faith and they saw it in action. They saw it in action. Natives of a third world country were given a sundial. They were thrilled as they learned how to tell time by observing the shadow of the sun on the face of the sundial. As days passed, this amazing instrument attracted such interest that the leaders of the tribe decided that it deserved some sort of worship. To the delight of the leaders, large crowds gathered to worship. However, this created a problem. They now feared for the safety of this remarkable device. It was decided that a beautiful building be erected to house it. This, they thought, would protect it from any would-be thief. The project was completed and a formal celebration was announced. As thousands gathered, the leaders stood before the sundial, at which time they made a startling discovery. The sundial, the center of attraction, was now useless. Rather than admit error, the leaders decided to preserve it as a shrine for future generations, thus preserving their dignity. You may smile as you, you hear this, but isn't this what we have done to the Christian faith. The church started over 1900 years ago with a strong workable faith, a faith in Christ that would change the lives, a faith that would direct their thinking, a faith that would produce action in the face of opposition. This faith was not pie in the sky or wishful thinking. It was reality before anything seen. Today, however, we tend to house our faith in beautiful buildings, hoping to preserve it. Have we enshrined our faith for future generations, hoping that they might guess what faith is all about? Has our faith become useless because of what we have done with it? Hmm. I believe the number one enemy to a biblical worldview is secularism. In other words, worldly thinking. The secular mindset 
is deficient towards God and does not believe in absolute values. The difficulty with this secular mindset is not so much that it can be found in our government institutions, universities, schools, media, entertainment, or our places of employment, but with intellectually secular Christians. These secular Christians read their Bibles, go to church, but their worldview is not biblical. It's not based on the Word of God. The reality of secular Christianity is very powerful, and the devil has been deceiving, deceiving multitudes of people. Multitudes. As Paul said, they would have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Number five, secular Christianity has become the great rival of the gospel of Jesus Christ and a true biblical worldview. I'll say that again. Secular Christianity has become the great rival of the gospel of Jesus Christ and a true biblical worldview. In other words, worldly thinking, human reasoning, the secular mindset, it's deficient towards God and does not believe in the absolutes of his word. The difficulty with this secular mindset, again, is that it has created compromise. Compromise. In the process, the Bible has been misinterpreted, retranslated, and twisted, all to fit the lifestyles and values of a particular mindset. So how do you answer these questions? Who am I? What am I? Why am I? Let me help you. Who am I? The Bible says in Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. What am I? Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. If you have a biblical worldview. Galatians, Paul said, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus. John says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Peter said in his first letter, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness, He's called you out of spiritual darkness. He's called you out of a spiritually dead worldview. And he's brought you into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see, the Lord is still breaking through the physical. He's still calling people to himself through the person of Jesus Christ. And why am I? Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We all, as believers, have purpose. We all have been called to do works for Jesus Christ. You are his workmanship. In fact, as Paul continues, in him we also, I'm sorry, in him we were also chosen. Having, be, having been predestined according to the plan of him who calls out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And let me just remind you, in this crazy world that we are living in, when so much is at stake and so many things are, are being weighed in the balance, you remember who you are. You've been called, you've been chosen, you've been set apart, you've been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession and it's all to the praise of his glory. And why am I? Why are you? Therefore, Paul said, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, 
holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer. Let me say it this way. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Abram joined with God in the making of a tremendous history. His obedience was crucial to what is known as God's fullness of time. His worldview was transformed. Our worldview has been and is being transformed. Or is it? Only you can answer that. Henry Blackaby says this, history never waits on our decision. We must respond to God the moment of his invitation. If you've been playing around with Christianity, if you're standing on the edge and you've got, you know, you're looking over and, and you're just, you're still in indecision, I would compel you, I plead with you, jump in. Dive in to God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He will give you clarity. He will give you purpose. You'll have a sense of belonging. And he will change how you view your world. As we segue into communion, the promise of our minds being made anew culminated in the sacrifice that Jesus made for us by purchasing us back by his body and his blood crucified on a cross that sacrificial lamb took away the sin, took away our sin, washes us white as snow. That sacrifice that we are to remember, that we're to dwell on, is God's love. It's God's call to every person that has ever lived. It's his call. Since the day Christ died, for every person that's ever lived from that time until this time right now. He now speaks. He's now revealed himself through the person of Jesus Christ. Paul said on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body which is given for you. Take this, eat this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. In the same way, scripture says he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, take, drink, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is given for the remission, given for the forgiveness of of sins and it's a new covenant and it's in his blood it's symbolic and it brings us back as you take this juice remember your sins have been forgiven you've been purchased you are now in a new covenant with god let's partake together father i thank you for this new covenant. I thank you for the sacrifice. I thank you for giving your son so that we could experience salvation. So we could experience what it means to be a child of God. So that we could experience being called out of darkness into wonderful, your marvelous, wonderful light. So we can declare the praises of you that has called us out of darkness into your light. That we can make altars every day as we worship you. We can leave reminders of the altars and what it means to worship God through the things that we do, testimonies of our faith. Lord, I pray you'd have your complete will and way with us as we charter these crazy times that we are in, the waters that make up the storm that we are in, Lord God, Give us clarity. 
I pray, Lord Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, may we receive the mind of Christ. May you mold and shape our understanding and our minds so that we can have a biblical worldview, a worldview that brings you glory. I ask this in Jesus' name.